Welcome to New York Bio's Virtual Breakfast Series, a digital program started in 2020, bringing you fireside chats with leaders from across the healthcare spectrum. This week, we're talking all aspects of corporate development with Emily Minkow of RA Ventures and Jason Kent of Cooley. I think we're about to flip to 901. Good morning, everyone. My name is Jennifer Hawks Bland, and I'm the CEO at New York Bio. And we're very excited that you're here with us for another edition of our virtual breakfast series. Um, special thanks to our partners at Cooley uh, for sponsoring this month's series of breakfast. And today we're going to get to hear some specific Cooley expertise um, in our guest, Jason Kent, and our other guest, Emily Minkow. We're going to talk about all things early stage venture funding. And um, even, well, I think we're gonna even probably talk some about the public markets and SPACs. It's gonna be a wide ranging conversation and we're glad you're here. As always, uh, the housekeeping, please ask your questions in the chat or the Q&A box. And Derek and I will get to those throughout the course of our conversation. With that, I'll kick it over to Derek to start us off and then we'll have a great conversation. Thanks everyone. All right, Jason and Emily, good morning. It's great to have both of you here. Uh, like Jennifer said, this is going to be fantastic. Uh, you know, uh, Prevail is one of, I think, the best, you know, New York City startup sto uh, stories in a long time. We have, you know, market stuff that's going crazy. We have a venture environment that I think is still really exciting. So there's a lot to dig into. So with both of you, why don't you each give us a little bit about your background and how you got where you are today, and we will jump in. Emily, why don't you go first? Sure. Thanks, Derek. I can start. Hi, everybody. I'm Emily Minkow. Um, I'm currently a venture partner at RA Capital. Um, I've been with the fund for a couple of months working on starting new biotech companies um, and operationalizing them and serving in interim roles um, in early stage companies in the venture side of RA Capital's portfolio. Uh, before that, I was chief business officer of Prevail Therapeutics, which Derek mentioned was a New York City based uh, biotech company from inception to its sale uh, to Eli Lilly a little over a year ago and is still a Lilly site in New York City. Uh, Prevail is focused on gene therapy for adult neurodegenerative diseases and genetically defined uh, subsets thereof. So I'm looking forward to talking more about the Prevail story. Um, and prior to Prevail, I spent most of my career at Celgene in Summit, New Jersey um, in a range of roles. A lot of my time in business development, also in global marketing for the launch of Otesla for psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis. Um, and as a chief of staff to the CEO, among other roles. Uh, before all of that, I started my career in strategy consulting, and I have a business background. I have an MBA, uh, not a scientist or a physician, but have been in this industry for my whole career. We won't hold the New Jersey against you. <laughs> Still the New York metro area. Yeah, yes. <laughs> we'll take it. It counts. Jason? Sure. Um, my name is Jason Kent. I'm a corporate partner at Cooley. I'm based in the New York office, so coming to you today from beautiful 55 Hudson Yards. Um, I, uh, I've been with Cooley pretty much my whole career, about uh, 23 years, and I am a, a really sort of broad general corporate lawyer. So I, the way I describe my practice is a life cycle practice. I work with companies all the way from startups to mid to late stage private through IPO and continuing on to the public company stage. So wide range of transactions, financings, M&A, board, facing governance, what have you. Um, but always in very much of a, of a key relationship role where I stay with the company through all stages of its life cycle and uh, during a lot of the sort of events and transactions that we're gonna be hopefully talking about today. Um, I work mostly with life science companies. I'd say about 80% of my practice is life science focused. I spent most of my career at Cooley in the San Diego office and relocated to New York relatively recently in part to help build out our life sciences presence here on the East Coast. That's exciting. And full disclosure, um, as I said, we have, I guess, two lawyers on the, uh, on the webinar today. Um, I was litigating. And so actually, Jason, they liked, his clients like to see coming because they help when I when you were to see me coming, it meant that disaster had occurred, <laughs> and we were trying to salvage something. <laughs> All right. Well, why don't we why don't we set the stage with a little bit of background? And I think a good way to kick this off, uh, Emily, is what can we talk a little bit about? Um, let's go into into depth about Prevail, right? Because I think it's it's interesting both from it's great from an outcomes perspective, but it's really interesting really from a market and a timing perspective too, because that a little bit of everything. I think it 
it kind of was at the tip of the leading edge of kind of the larger A rounds of financing. You have Jonathan Silverstein, who's a patient advocate himself, funding the company. You really kind of have a lot of stories here coming into one. So why don't you take us through a little bit of kind of the history and how everything came together with Prevail, kind of at the beginning more than more so than at the end. Sure. Yeah. No. Thanks for that that question. Um, I'll start maybe a little bit with kind of my personal story of how I got involved and, and how I met Jonathan. Um, so so you mentioned Jonathan Silverstein. Uh, who's a managing partner at Orbi Med and uh, was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease with a GBA mutation and kind of told his story publicly um, in 2017 when that occurred. And he and his wife, Natalie, started the Silverstein Foundation for Parkinson's with GBA uh, with the idea that they could give grants to fund kind of early stage research approaches for that disease um, and, and, you know, advance towards therapeutics, but also find kind of basic research and better understanding. So, uh, as Jonathan was putting the foundation together, he approached uh, various pharmas to be uh, corporate donors, and um, we took a meeting with him when I was at Celgene, and at the time I was in business development, and I was responsible for the inflammation and immunology deal flow, and then also neurodegenerative disease deal flow, because I think that year, or maybe the year before, at, at J.P. Morgan, our CEO had said, you know, we were treating cancer and immune inflammatory disease, and the next pillar for cell gene is going to be neurodegeneration. And we wanted to build that largely through um, kind of an external R&D and partnership strategy since it hadn't historically been a core area for cell gene. So I was working, you know, learning more and more about neurodegenerative diseases uh, through looking at business development opportunities in partnership with some great scientific colleagues who knew the space. And uh, they suggested we meet with Jonathan and learn about what he was doing. And um, we were really inspired and kind of quickly decided to uh, move to, to give a $5 million donation to the foundation, no strings attached, because we thought here's you know a patient advocate who's incredibly inspiring um, and passionate. And, and more than that, you know throughout his career as a venture capitalist knows um, how to bring companies together, knows how to advance yeah. therapies for the clinic, knows how to really translate these scientific ideas into therapies for patients. So kind of who, who better to support? Um, so we we made it happen quickly because Jonathan had a um, kind of public appearance coming up on CNBC to to talk about his story and the foundation and and he said you know I'll give Selgene a shout out if we can get the documents done in time. So so we did and and we got the shout out. So I was watching and um, Jonathan also announced that Orbi Med and the Silverstein Foundation had funded seed funded the first company to come out of this effort and it was going to be called Prevail Therapeutics and mm -hmm. taking a gene therapy approach uh, founded. Um, by Asa Abeljevich from Columbia University, who was going to be the CEO, and then it was going to be based right in New York City, where I happened to live. So I thought, you know, I had been, um, as a business development person, you're kind of always across the table from entrepreneurs and um, executives at small biotech companies. So I had grown to be friends with many of these people through, you know, doing deals across the table over the years and always was interested in what that role would be like and, and, and the job on that side of the table. So it had been something I was thinking about, but then just, um, kind of the timing of, of, you know, hearing about Jonathan's story, and I had become more and more interested in neurodegeneration. So I basically put up my hand and said, you know, do you need a business person? And they kind of said, when, when can you start? So um, because those of that kind of timing and serendipity, I joined the company really early. Um, I was employee number six. So Asa had uh, put the company together with Orbi Med, and I think in October of 2017, hired the first people um, and moved into the Alexandria Center um, on the east side of Manhattan. And we we started putting the company together. Um, so we raised the Series A probably four months later, and then uh, Series B about a year later, and an IPO three months after that. So I think, you know, that that's kind of the rapid financing progress um, that you alluded to, and I can talk more about how that came together. Yeah. Um, but I think you know the important thing is is also rapid kind of scientific progress and. Um, you know, an extreme focus on, on developing therapies and getting them into the clinic. And I think that was inspired by Jonathan. And when you have a patient kind of at the, at the core um, of your culture and of the founding of the company, you realize like these, are, we need to urgently um, get new therapies to patients and into clinical trials. Um, they can be tested for safety and efficacy. So, so we moved really quickly. I, um, our first program, we kind of started designing it. We didn't in license it. We started designing it, you know, in, in that fall of 2017 when the company came together and, and we got our first IND accepted 19 months later. Um, so if that's interesting, we can talk more about kind of how did we do that? And so um, I think that's, you know, an important 
part of how we were able to execute rapidly on the financing side is also you know executing rapidly on the therapeutic development side. Well, it was um, also the earlier days of gene therapy, wasn't it? I mean, it wasn't. I imagine it wasn't like uh, it wasn't like now. I, I imagine the choices of things to go and in license were either slim pickings or, you know, honestly, if it was all in academia, I imagine it was all early enough where you were going to have to do most of the heavy lifting yourself anyway. Yeah. So I think. Yeah, that, I mean, I think the timing, you know, and you mentioned a large Series A, so we raised a $75 million Series A about four months after we put the company right. together, so we were still really early on the program side then, and I think the reason for it is kind of the convergence of two things. So ASA's um, research and life's work had been around the genetics, uh, the human genetics of neurodegenerative diseases, and kind of this, can we, through observation of you know, large human genetic studies comparing people with these diseases to healthy controls, find genes, and then what are those that are mutated in patients who develop, you know, Parkinson's, temporal dementia, Alzheimer's, and then can we unravel the biology and see um, how do these mutations cause disease, and then can we design therapeutics to kind of reverse um, whatever that genetic deficit is and, mm -hmm. and therefore slow or stop disease progression. And that is what us as academic research had been focused on, and so I think the timing for Prevail was kind of right scientifically because we had really cracked open uh, understanding of targets like GBA and Parkinson's disease and GRN and frontotemporal dementia. Um, and, you know, if you look nowadays, there are, there are a lot of companies that are pursuing those targets, but it was, we were unique and differentiated at the time, I think, yeah. and the understanding of those targets had kind of very recently come to light. And at the same time, in the past, we, the industry had had challenges of, okay, even if you identify promising targets, we don't really have a great way to deliver large molecules into the brain. Or the central nervous system. Um, and around the time that we were putting Prevail together, there had started to be some real clinical success with AAV9 gene therapy, um, thinking of Avaxis and others showing that AAV9 is a modality that you know you can manufacture, um, yeah. that, that you can deliver safely, and that can effectively deliver a large molecule into the central nervous system. So I think those two things kind of came together of the the human genetic understanding <clears throat> of these diseases and the state of the art of gene therapy that made it the right time to launch a company like this. Um, and so when we went to pitch our series A, we had, you know, we were really, I think, unique and differentiated in kind of pursuing first in class targets, but without kind of the extreme risk that you might or investors might associate typically with first in class programs because the targets had been de-risked through human genetics and the modality had kind of been de-risked through the work of, of Exus and others. Yeah. yeah, I imagine also having having Jonathan and the work that the foundation had done, uh, either from a method of action standpoint or or really just from a target standpoint or just his general experience. I mean, he's you know really at the top of the top in terms of investing. I imagine that's a remarkable vote of confidence to have you know on your side of the table going into those discussions. Yeah, exactly, and and certainly his work has advanced the field scientifically. Um, on the investment side, I'd say you know Jonathan and Orby met wonderful to provide introductions, but always we're clear, you know, you've got to succeed on your own merits and, and get the introduction, but then the pitch you're on your own. And certainly all of our investors, um, you know, grilled us and asked us the questions that we had to kind of earn that series A. Yeah. So Can we take a step back though, and talk a little bit about, so the, the genesis obviously was, was Jonathan's efforts and the, the foundation and, you know, a, a definite plug here, New York Bio is hosting our second annual patient engagement summit. Uh, next week on April 6th. So can we talk about a little bit about working with a foundation to stand up a research organization? And Jason, maybe you can talk about some of the examples you've seen with companies going ahead and working early in the rare disease space with patient advocacy groups. Because I think, I don't want us to lose sight of the ability to accelerate discovery that comes from really listening and working with the patients um, early on. Sure. Yeah, happy to do that. I, you know, I, it, it, we, you mentioned rare disease and had the good fortune to work with a lot of companies in the rare disease space relatively recently. And a consistent theme that I've seen through most of those companies is um, really considerable patient engagement, um, whether it be with advocacy groups, whether it would be with, uh, you know, sort of individual individual patients who are in, um, you know, pediatric diseases with parents of, of the patients. Um, and that, that has a lot of benefits. Obviously, there's, you know, there's benefits when it comes to supporting the, the clinical trial process and informing how the clinical trial process is designed. 
um, from a regulatory standpoint, it can be helpful. But what I've also seen is um, really from a from a team standpoint, from a culture standpoint for the company, it really does um, help incentivize and encourage um, the employees of the company, the investors of the company, to have that direct visibility into the impact that the program is having um, on the patients' lives. I forget who this quote is attributed to, but uh, it, it's either Matthew Herper or, or one of the other leading journalists. But you know, it's always good to remember that you know every every data point has a face, right? Every data point is a person, and especially when you're working with uh, rare diseases and you're working directly with patients, you know those data points' names, you know who they are, and in a lot of a lot of cases, you know their families as well. So, you know, I imagine it's a pretty big you know galvanizing point to have. You know your your data points be people that also you know you have their phone numbers and email addresses and you know it's in terms of you know a galvanizing mission that's a pretty big one. Yeah, I, that was key at Prevail as well. I think you know the human genetic um, <clears throat> studies that I mentioned that helped elucidate you know new targets um, for disease modifying therapies. Many of those were sponsored or assisted or even run by foundations like Parkinson's Foundation or Michael J. Fox Foundation. So that so. You know, patient groups um, are are partners all the way from kind of funding basic research that provides unique insights all the way to you know the very personal, um, like you mentioned, Derek, where you know where you're, we would work um, with. For example, we also developed our lead program for type two and three um, neuropathic Gaucher disease, which is a rare subset of a rare disease, and and there, you know, the patient groups are are pretty well organized because it's a small community, and you can get very specific feedback on ideas about clinical trial design or what kind of target product profile would be um, acceptable or desirable to the patient community and it, it becomes really personal. Yeah, I think it's one of the areas that that the industry has actually moved forward a lot in the last decade. I think foundations uh, and patient groups in particular are smarter about the way that they that they fund research. I think they're they've gained probably a lot more respectability and a lot of them are now you know, respected venture players as well. So Jason, I wonder if you have some thoughts on kind of how that came to be and what some of the bigger elements there were. I mean, you've seen, you know, markets change all over the place, but I think that's one kind of large difference in the last decade is that, you know, the groups that represent the patient are much, much more represented on, I will say the capital side of the table and on what kind of things get funded and what kind of companies get started. Yeah, I, I would certainly say, um, in the last few years, we've seen more of that side of the, you know, sort of funding landscape built out, whether it be, uh, you know, institutions or um, other sort of, you know, philanthropic type groups. Um, I wouldn't say that that has, you know, supplanted entirely or, um, or, you know, really had that significant of an impact on, you know, some of the more traditional modes of funding, um, yeah. capital funding. Once you get to the public markets, um, you know, more of the traditional institutions. Um, but what I really have seen uh, is, you know, we talked a, a little bit about how quickly Prevail went from founding to Series A to Series B to IPO. Um, what I've really seen in the last few years that's been a notable trend is how quickly that's happened. And, you know, I think there's a few different reasons for that. Uh, but, you know, one is the, 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 increasing number of companies that are sort of founded around a particular team or a particular product or compound that's in licensed from industry that is you know sort of already phase two or maybe even phase three ready and that's what enables these you know sort of really significant series a rounds of you know 100 million 150 million and then sort of immediately after that, either a series B or a crossover, and then right into the IPO. And um, that's just something that, you know, a decade, two decades ago. Yeah, it didn't happen. It happened, right? It was sort of traditional biotech where you did the series A, and you had, you know, five to eight years before you were going public. And that time frame was really compressed significantly um, in, the last, in the last few years. Yeah, it's funny you mentioned Prevail at a $75 million Series A, and at the time it was big, and now it's like, eh, it sounds about right. <laughs> That's about average. At the time, it was a really big deal. I think it was, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, Emily, it wasn't uh, the $100 million A rounds weren't exactly in vogue just about yet then, were they? 
No, that's that's right. I think we thought uh, there was a, a healthy Series A and yeah. you know, broad ambitions for the company and a lot of programs that we wanted to advance uh, towards the clinic, making investments early in manufacturing. So, um, you know, we certainly had a had a clear plan uh, to spend it. But you're right. I think there were not as many kind of hundred million plus Series A's at that time as we saw in recent years. So another, an interesting question here, and, and Jason, I suppose this is a little bit more for you, but Emily, you can weigh in from uh, the RA side, or at least the way that, that you look at things. Um, so with the public markets where they are, Jason, do you see this impact kind of the overall appetite for, uh, for venture funding and, and new company creation? Do you, do you see people thinking early and early now uh, about what the uh, about what they think the public market is going to do in the future. Does that impact formation or not really? I, I haven't really seen it impact formation or private financing in a meaningful way yet. So, okay. so you're right. I mean, for all intents and purposes, the the IPO window is sort of you know closed, maybe temporarily at this point. I, you know, we have a lot of clients aware of a lot of companies that are still um, preparing. You know, filing sort of, you know, moving their process along. But, uh, you know, until things get clearer in um, Ukraine, I, I just, I, I don't think those companies are going to be able to go out. But I think there's an expectation, um, you know, and hopefully this is the case, that um, these things are going to resolve sometime in the next uh, few months and the IPO window will open back up. And so I don't think, and, you know, Emily can weigh in on this from the, investor perspective, I don't think companies are saying, I'm not going to fund that company because I'm worried that they're not going to be able to go public in two or three years and get for my funds. Um, you know, it's important to keep in mind that, um, you know, notwithstanding the, the quick pace at which fundings have been moving over the last few years, um, biotech is a long game. Yeah. Um, you know, right. these are investments that have, you know, long time horizons. So, um, Anyway, that, that's my take on it. Emily, what are you saying? Yeah, I agree. And I, I think um, we don't necessarily look kind of ahead. It's not like the public markets are a poll and that's why companies get created. I think more of like the push of ideas um, coming out of you know the scientific community and that the poll is patient unmet needs. And so there's certainly um, just as many or kind of more exciting scientific insights coming out of academia, coming out of you know ideas of, of entrepreneurs at venture funds, um, and there certainly are still patient unmet needs. And I think kind of the proliferation we have of different therapeutic modalities um, gives us more tools uh, to um, combat you know different patient diseases. And so the the well is still kind of springing forth as many good ideas. And so I think you know, high, high quality investors will have access to great deal flow and uh, be able to fund the companies that, you know, they see truly have the potential to make an impact for patients in a unique and differentiated way. And that truly have kind of a path to value creation that you can lay out where you look at how your investment will lead to certain de-risking um, or value creation or unlocking or of um, how to solve a problem or opening up new opportunities. Um, so as long as you think you can do that, I think, you know, the, the, the um, well-capitalized venture funds that have been in the space for a while and know that biotech is a long game, as Jason said, uh, will continue to fund early companies. I think um, you're right. There's no kind of guarantee of going public. So you might, you need to have different kind of contingency plans for creating value. But I do think, you know, for truly kind of like unique and differentiated um, stories, there will be investment, maybe you need to stay private for longer than you thought, uh, maybe you do a pharma partnership and get some access to non-dilutive capital, where before you would have kind of tried to hold on to all the rights and go straight for the public market, so there could be different paths along the way, but um, we have, you know, capital around the table, we have people who are kind of passionate about advancing new therapeutics around the table, and I think, I think they're going to keep doing that. Well, and that's what I was going to say, too, I think that while the IPO window has certainly We'll call it cracked <laughs> if it's not closed, right? Um, I, I think we've seen just a, f a few trickle in. Um, we, we've still seen large funds being closed. So I think the capital, right, is still out there. Um, what are you all seeing? And Jason, um, for your non-named companies, right, that, that are thinking IPO in the future, what, how have you seen those companies pivot 
in their fundraising plans if, if IPO isn't on the table for the near term? Yeah, so I think it's, um, it's very consistent with what Emily just mentioned. Um, you know, there are, there's an imperative for companies to think more creatively about how to raise money. And, you know, that can be doing, um, you know, sort of a, a smaller round, maybe more of an insider round in lieu of doing a major crossover round in the lead up to an IPO. Um, it could be taking a very creative look at the, uh, you know, the pipeline and figuring out, gosh, um, you know, what's the trade-off between us continuing to own worldwide rights and everything, or maybe we're going to do, you know, an out license in Asian territories and try to raise some funds that way, right? Um, at an earlier stage, a lot of companies are, you know, leaning more into um, grant funding, right, and, and other sort of non dilutive funding that, that might be that might be out there. Yeah, I think to the extent that um, you're a little muffled, Jason. Oh, sorry. That's okay. And I think to the extent that, yeah, and I think to the extent that, um, you know, market conditions in the public markets uh, continue to be choppy and um, ultimately permeate down to late stage private companies that were otherwise preparing to go public, we see some more activity in terms of M&A and combinations of companies um, attempting to, you know, take advantage of some synergies and, and see if one plus one equals three, right? Yeah. So... Emily, at this point, given where given where a lot of these fields have have advanced to in in if you think about kind of the advancement of different modalities, it's a bit of a different environment than when Prevail got started. So as as a venture partner, as you're thinking about kind of you know a new company to start or a new venture to kick off, how do you think about differentiation now from a scientific standpoint? What are some of the things that kind of stand out to you in terms of new opportunities and what are some of the things you look for to, you know, provide that differentiation in, in you know, a market with, you know, a lot of, you know, kind of well-funded earlier stage uh, startups. How do you make the opportunity that you think about stand out? Yeah, and that's a great question. I mean, I think, um, I think a lot about the genetic medicine space, uh, uh, just because I was in that space at Prevail, and there's certainly um, a lot of advancements in gene therapy with kind of new, new capsids. There's advancements in gene editing or RNA therapeutics. Um, so that's all been really exciting to see, and I, I think a lot about kind of the disease landscape. And and um, you know, my personal opinion is that. Um, of advancements in delivery modalities to allow us as a community to access different tissues um, and cells and parts of the body uh, durably are going to be really important to the, the reach of these medicines. Um, and so that's something I'm interested in is kind of what are kind of the next frontiers of delivery. It's a hard uh, nut to crack. Um, but I think that is something that can kind of really open up the space because I think I think what is not differentiated is kind of to go after the same diseases as everybody else or be competing in a clinical trial landscape, um, yep. especially for a rare, uh, small patient population. Um, so I think, you know, delivery is something I watch out for, um, you know, on the cell therapy side, I think of lots of people and lots of companies have been trying to think about what are the, what are the advances needed to crack into solid tumors? Is it different antigens? Um, is it different kind of armor for cell therapies that will help penetrate the tumor microenvironment. Like, mm -hmm. so there are kind of, if you look at kind of each subsector, I think there are um, kind of unlocks that will enable like a pool of, of companies or technologies to go to go after and help different patient populations. Um, mm -hmm. So I think I, I try to think about like, what are those unlocks that, that allow you to do something um, different than what other companies have done. Um, and then I think, you know, another this is sort of speaking with a broad brush, but novel biology is an area that um, is important to invest in, but it's kind of hard to invest in because I think when you're a small company, there's a lot of pressure to kind of like, what's your first program? What's your timeline to development candidate? What's your timeline to IND and getting in the clinic? So, so you see a lot of companies with novel modalities kind of saying, okay, well, I don't want to stack risks. So I'm going to pick, um, you know, a target that's de-risked for my first program, be it right. de-risked by other programs in the clinic um, that maybe haven't served, you know, the, the patient population fully and this modality could serve it better, or at least kind of de-risked by human genetics and kind of a clear like monogenic um, link between genotype and phenotype. Um, and, and that certainly makes sense because you don't want to stack risks. But I think, you know, when I think about kind of the future broadly, it's like, okay, well, 
there's still plenty of diseases um, that we haven't kind of figured out how to treat. So who's going to make the investment in biology uh, to crack some of those? And is it, could it be in partnership with academia? Could it be in partnership with pharma? Could it be, you know, back to our conversation of foundations? Foundations can be a great way to bring different industry players together to do some of that basic research. Um, but I think that's going to be really kind of important for the future too, especially as we have so many kind of companies out there developing great tools and, and um, I think there could be more places to apply those tools. Yeah, as, a, as an industry, we do want to kind of avoid the, you know, the, the scenario where every single cell therapy company has to run a, uh, a CD19 focused trial to, uh, to show proof of whatever it is in their, in their modality or their vehicle before they get to uh, get to the next target that's actually their, you know, the, the thing they really want to hit. So, Jason, we can, I want to send something over to you, which is kind of I'll ask about kind of broad market sentiment, right? Whether it's whether it's public or whether it's private, you know, do you see, you've seen this before, right? So what are the differences between kind of say a hot market where deals get done at, at, at the speed of light and things where people start to kind of slow down, um, maybe not 2008 nuclear winter style things, but, you know, given those, given those balances of things, what are some of the things that affect that kind of investor investor sentiment and the obvious follow-on to that is you know do you see us you know do you see the pendulum swinging towards people pumping the brakes and slowing down on the venture side or do you see this as you know almost decorrelated from where venture can go so i'll answer the second question first um with respect to the impact of broader market conditions and public market conditions on the venture market mm -hmm. Um, I, I don't I don't see an impact yet. Okay. And I think as as Emily um, alluded to earlier, um, you know the funds are there, the investments are being made in the right companies, the right teams, and so on. Um, you know there could be some sort of correlative effect on valuation. Um, yeah. You could see some impact on deal terms. But I think those deals are going to continue to get done. And I think that's going to happen for the foreseeable future. Um, it's frankly a bit of a different environment on the public side right now, just based on what we're seeing um, in the markets. Um, you know, there's a lot of companies that are sitting on the sidelines that have gone public, say, in the last, you know, two to five years and need to raise more funds uh, because they are still pre-revenue or uh, maybe only have one product and are looking to build out the rest of their portfolio. And frankly, those companies are, are waiting. Um, they're sitting on the sidelines. Um, there have been, I guess recently, there was maybe three companies last week that raised about um, 1.5 billion in total. So, so there have been deals that are getting done, but I think right now it's still the exception rather than the rule. And the thing that's really the most remarkable to me about what we're seeing in the markets right now is um, how so many life science companies are trading with valuations that are at or below cash. Yes. Uh, it's just it's something that is, is really challenging. And you know, when you're, when you're a board of directors and trying to figure out sort of what you're going to do and um, your stock is so undervalued relative to what you believe the value of the company is, um, it makes for some hard decisions about financing or possibly looking at M&A or, or combinations. Um, so I think the next quarter or two are going to really tell us a lot about what's going to happen with those companies because, um, you know, life science companies, particularly pre-revenue ones, need a lot of money. Yep. And so yes. some, you know, whether it be funding, um, whether it be M and A, et cetera, and I think um, you know if things don't improve, you're going to see more M and A. You're going to see funding with, um, frankly, more challenging terms, creative terms. Um, you're going to see some combinations, and you know, frankly, you're probably going to see a few companies that might um, go out of business. Let's hope that doesn't happen. Um, I think everybody is keeping their fingers crossed that things will resolve here in the near term, and we'll be, you know, back to sort of business as usual. So Emily, in terms of pools of capital, I think one of the things also that has changed a bit over the last 10 years is you have far more funds that were initially tech investors that have 
kind of stepped into the either pure biotech or at least kind of tech enabled biotech, et cetera. So from your perspective, if you think now, how do you think about you know, different kinds of people that you may want around the table in terms of either your cap table or the other kind of advisory voices you want on the funding side when you think about a new venture. I mean, RA is obviously a big fund. They've invested in a number of, of things that could be tech enabled. Um, you know, from your perspective as a potential kind of founder entrepreneur, how do you think now about bringing that kind of expertise onto the cap table? Um, <clears throat> that's a good question. And I think, um, in past years, like kind of the tech enabled biotech was more a niche corner of biotech. And now I kind of think it's kind of everything. Um, yeah. so there's very, you know, there are companies that kind of have very core to their, um, model that they're using in silico capabilities to model interactions or to discover novel pockets to drug or something like that or bring together kind of all the, the machine learning and AI tools to develop and optimize say small molecules but also a broad range of companies use you know this kind of technology to try to understand um, structure activity relationship or if they're looking at kind of libraries of different candidates to try to instead of having to empirically screen all of them you know predict better uh, which will work best and why so when I talk to um, counterparts at kind of more historically tech focused VCs, I find that they've kind of broadened the, the pool of um, stuff that they'll, they'll look at and they want there to be kind of a platform technology, but I think often there is. Um, and then of course, you know, we haven't talked as much yet on this call. I think we should about ta access to talent, access to talent mm -hmm. is. That's um, where we're going next. Oh, good. Okay. Even more, you know, limiting factor, I think that access to capital a lot of the time. Um, so having people around the table who, um, you know, now that you want kind of more computational biology or some of those um, sets of expertise in a company having access to the tech world and, and the talent and networks um, in that world, I think can be really helpful too. Um, and, and then, you know, this is uh, different than the tech side, but in terms of who else you want to have around the table, I do think um, pharmas can be important partners to have around the table from early on in the life cycle of a company. Um, so to have a corporate pharma venture fund or a direct equity investment from a pharma um, in your series A or series B, you know, can give the company access to another perspective. And I think that's really helpful because um, kind of tying it to, into what we're talking about, it's about the capital markets. Like, I think you always build a company to kind of remain independent and go all the way through, you know, phase three and commercialization. But the reality is, um, if you're successful, I think M&A can be a good outcome for everybody because often large pharma have those late development and um, commercialization capabilities worldwide that are expensive and challenging for a small biotech to build. So if that's a possible outcome, you know, they, they are a potential customer for the company someday. So knowing how they think about the world and how they see value in the different programs and targets that, that a small biotech is considering very early on um, is useful. And then, you know, they also have kind of really practical day-to-day -day ways that they can help from relationships with KOLs to, you know, regulatory insights in different markets to manufacturing insights as you try to scale up. So um, I think that, you know, Part of our ecosystem is like alive and well and thriving and, and there's a lot of great relationships where pharmas can provide kind of capital advice but they know that that, that that everyone kind of realizes that that doesn't mean the company's beholden to them or that they have you know the first kind of right of first negotiation from the bd side um but they're they're an equity investor alongside everybody else yeah i i, I think you can't underestimate the importance of a strong and thriving ecosystem in company formation and and support. And I think that covers all of the areas that Emily was talking about. And if you take a step back and think maybe a little bit more broadly, I think it, it also covers all of your external advisors. I'm not just talking about lawyers, but I'm talking about, you know, accountants and bankers and, uh, you know, finance, um, real estate, you know, the amount of um, money and investment that, um, you know, groups like Alexandria have put into building out real estate um, in places like New York and, and elsewhere. Um, that is that is really important to have there. I mean, you know, a, a, a company, a, a, a young and growing company, um, is hard to put together, particularly under some of the timelines that we're talking about. And mm -hmm. you need to have a group of supportive advisors that have sort of done it before, that are familiar with how to work with companies in that space. Um, and uh, you know, that's that's again, I think why why having an ecosystem is so critical. 
Yeah, in, in New York, I mean, and I think our audience knows this, um, it, we have a lot, um, a high concentration of early stage companies, right? And so it's been great for those um, C-suite folks to learn from each other, but it also helps as we have people like Emily who have exited, right? And they're doing something different now and they have a different area of expertise that they're adding um, to the repertoire. So um, it takes time to mature an ecosystem, but I feel like New York has, um, we've sort of hit our stride. And hopefully we've solved the, when I first got here a few years ago, the, there's nowhere to, there's nowhere to build an office or whatever. Well, the good news is we have lots of real estate options now. So that's been helpful. Yeah, I, I genuinely don't, I, I think that's, I think we've done away with that as an excuse. I think that's, that's gone. If you can't figure that out now, then you have other problems. Emily, when you, so you were employee number six at Prevail, right? So talk to us about building um, a, a company, but an employee base, right? A, a, and plugging into the New York ecosystem. How did that work for you all? And how was New York advantageous as you built that out? Sure, yeah. Um, you know, I definitely learned a lot about <clears throat> building a team. And I think, uh, also was a great leader and kind of really has a great skill at finding people on LinkedIn and reaching out and pulling people together. So we did it in a kind of very scrappy way. It wasn't like we ported a team in from another company. We really kind of built it from the ground up. And I think New York was a great place to do that. Um, there are many great academic institutions um, in New York City with postdocs, um, a lot of them focusing kind of scientifically on the areas we were interested in. So for our um, scientific team, we were able to hire a lot of people kind of directly from the New York institutions. Um, there also is kind of a, um, there are a range of kind of experienced people from pharma in the New York metro area, you know, thinking about it broadly. So there are many pharmaceutical companies in New Jersey, in, in Westchester, in Connecticut, and, and obviously a uh, few in New York City as well. So we kind of got, um, I think, kind of the right mix of people with some pharma expertise who kind of knew how drug development was done at, at that resource level. And then I think you also want people in the mix who've done biotech and, and have been in an entrepreneurial environment. Um, and since, you know, it's not, hasn't historically hadn't been quite as broad of an ecosystem in, in New York City, but there were some people there like that um, as well that we were able to hire. Um, you know, I'll mention kind of Philadelphia is nearby and that it was also a hub for gene therapy research um, at the university and some institutions there. So, so that was helpful. Um, and then, you know, there were times that we had a position that needed, you know, a specific skill set. And we said, you know, we are willing to hire outside the New York metro area and we'll do Zoom and we'll have people kind of coming in on this type of schedule. Um, but we, I think, were careful to strike a balance with that. So we've had kind of enough in-person culture to really connect and gel as a team. And then sometime on Zoom, and you know what, that ended up preparing us really well for COVID. We didn't know that that was coming. But um, that, you know, in about exactly two years ago, that move was pretty yes. seamless for us because we had been used to, you know, when you're on the phone, make sure we pause and get the input from our colleagues who aren't in the room. And um, we were we had that kind of culture. Um, so, you know, building a company in New York was great. And another thing, you know, I really do think made us able to go quickly and be successful was um, a relatively very small amount of turnover. Um, I hear from colleagues in some of the ecosystems um, like Cambridge that um, there are so many, especially kind of in the height of the markets, like there's so many new companies coming together all the time that companies are luring yeah. away people and poaching and there's lots of turnover. And, we had, I, I don't think it's just because of the markets. I think it's because of the mission of our company, um, our culture, our passion, you know, for the patient and our, our belief in what we were doing that made it so exciting that made people stay. But it was really nice to have that kind of team continuity and really got to know each other and um, got to know how to work cross-functionally and kind of knowing aspects of our program inside and out that, that made us able to move uh, quickly towards the clinic. Yeah. Yeah, I think we found that, oh, I was just going to say along those lines, as we've talked to guests over the past almost two years, right, of our virtual yep. records, you know, one thing we've heard is that people in New York, people that want to be in New York want to be in New York, and they're happy to be there. So I think it's it's not like in Cambridge with the, the old adage of they go out for coffee and they come back with a new job. <laughs> <laughs> How do you think about team building now, now that we, now that we've kind of gone through, you know, the, the zoom era over the past two years, I think the, you know, is, is there less of an emphasis on 
needing to be there in, in person? Or, you know, how do, how do you think about that in terms of both culture and, and recruiting now? Well, that's a really good question. I mean, I think, you know, for kind of the business, legal, finance functions, I think have been able to operate pretty well over, over Zoom and um, less of a need to be in person. I think for a lot of scientific functions, you know, we still need to be in the lab. And then I also think for company culture, it's important to kind of be together, um, you know, around the table, kind of throwing out ideas and debating them. That certainly can be done virtually, but I think I think it's gonna be finding a balance that's gonna be critical for companies that are coming together now where you have kind of enough in-person time that, that people really gel as a team. And um, I've had to use this phrase a few times, but I do really think one of the most important things in a small company is working cross-functionally. Like you can't just kind of work in your silo. Um, you have to kind of think about how to solve problems across the board and, and those ideas could come from anywhere. So. There are certainly ways to do it, but I think um, you have to kind of have that connectivity in a small team. And but you know, the fun thing about a small team is that you can do that, and you can even have a Zoom where everyone can participate. Um, so I think it will be a balance. But you know, we're a unique industry where we still often need uh, wet labs and to be in a place. So I think that will continue to be important. Yeah, Jason, does that dovetail? Does that does that fit with what you've seen across your clients as well? Uh, it does. It does. I mean, it, it, it's an interesting trend that Emily alluded to it with Prevail. I think even before the pandemic, we saw sort of an increasing move of companies to uh, to go virtual, right? Um, driven by many reasons, part of it being the need for talent and, you know, somebody being across the country yet being the, the right person for the company. Um, so I think a lot of life sciences companies were already sort of grappling with how to do things virtually before we got ourselves in our in our current situation, uh, which we're hopefully getting out of now. Um, but look, we we face we face these issues, um, you know, with with our own business at, at Cooley. Um, you know, how do we how do we team build? How do we mentor? How do we um, uh, affirm our culture in a situation where, you know, frankly, for the foreseeable future, people are not going to be in the office five days a week. Um, so trying to find that balance between, you know. Um, you know, bringing people in when other people are going to be there, allowing flexibility for people yeah. to work from home if needed, but above all, still creating the right, you know, connectivity, um, whether it be in person or, or otherwise. I, I think everyone struggled, but I do think when we've had in-person meetings over the last six months, right? I mean, really not before that at all. Um, there is a palpable benefit to being in the room and having that discussion. So my hope is that we, we with fits and starts, we find that balance. And I think it'll be different probably for every organization, right? Do you see that across your um, investing in your clients? Like that it depends on the organization? Yeah, I mean, I think everybody kind of does get that benefit from the hallway uh, conversations, but there's also, I think if, Strong relationships are already formed that can continue virtually, whether it's like chatting or Slack or instant message or texting or yeah. whatever, like you still kind of have those side conversations. I think it's to me like the harder part is brand new relationships um, and, you know, kind of building that trust and dialogue. Um, so like when you're talking about forming a new biotech company, I think some, some time to form that trust and culture is important. But then I think once you have it, you can you know, seamlessly continue to communicate. Yeah, I think it speaks a lot to leadership too, right? You know, how do you, you know, as, as you as a leader, how do you form relationships with people? And how do you kind of set culture on what's important? How do we communicate? And, you know, how do you stay on mission? If because now, you know, if there's a new variant, if there's anything like that, you have to be quick enough to deal with whatever it is you have to deal with. Um, you know, I think one of the, you know, one of the really interesting early conversations we had here was with Nancy Thornberry. And, you know, talking about the way that Calliope adjusted their entire operational structure to basically accommodate for, you know, if they can get in the lab, how do they get in the lab? How do they get in the lab safe, safely? Uh, you know, now hopefully we've learned a little bit more and can do that. But, you know, I think it speaks to the fact that you have to be nimble. And I think it speaks to the fact that you have to kind of, you know, understand that, that things can change and, you know, being an adaptable leader is probably even more important now. Mm -hmm. And it's, I mean, it's true in drug development, you have to adapt to challenges all the time and things can change. So hopefully, you know, we're, we have leaders in our industry um, with kind of those skills and that agility. 
I was just uh, oh, I was just talking to uh, uh, Life Sciences Biotech CEO the other day, um, and you know the, the company had um, received some news that was not optimal from FDA, and you know he was on the one hand disappointed, but on the other hand invigorated because you know he's like, look, this is this is what we do in biotech. You know, challenges we find creative solutions. Um, you know, if it was all smooth sailing, you know, it wouldn't really be interesting or, or fun or or um, or rewarding, even right. I mean, it's, it's working through those challenges and trying to get to the other side that ultimately um, ultimately is the mark of a good leader. Yeah, yeah. Per perseverance. You have to have a um, perseverance as a skill set to to be in our in our industry, right? Um, we did have a question from the audience. Um, I don't want to throw us totally back into the the market discussion. Um, but we had not covered this. Um, the question is, will there be more acquisitions by SPACs, right, in biotech? And I do know that um, it, it doesn't take long to see the list of SPACs that have raised capital that need to find targets by either later this year or first quarter, right, 23. Um, what are you all, um, what, what is your crystal ball, both of you, tell us on, on that front? Yeah, so so my sense on the SPAC market right now is that it's it's probably not in a real great place. Um, it, it, you know, the the pipe market is, for all intents and purposes, sort of um, on hold. So it's difficult to find funding on the back end um, for your SPAC. Um, the you know redemption percentages are you know sort of sky high, um, and you know frankly, there's been increasing regulatory scrutiny on SPACs. I think the SEC is meeting this week to talk about some new, um, you know, regulations that could potentially have an impact on the market. So, um, you know, I, I, we, we do have companies, uh, clients that are still looking actively at SPACs and at combinations. Um, again, very much like the IPO process, trying to be ready um, because if things do open up and things start moving again, um, you know, nobody wants to be at the back of the line. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, you know, I'm focused more on early stage company creation, um, so haven't haven't been considering that in this market. But I think as a entrepreneur or leader, it's like you need you need to be kind of ready for whatever avenues come up, and you need to scenario plan. Um, so, like Jason said, I think you know you have to kind of focus on using the capital you have wisely, creating value, and kind of being ready for for different avenues for fundraising. Yeah. It's it's funny how things change. You know, there was there was a period of time here where we were almost required to ask about the SPAC market and say, is you know, do we think there's an end to this? Where do we think that is? And now things change. We had uh, the last emerging company showcase that we had. You know, David Berry uh, had just you know pulled out his the SPAC for Velo, and you know, he and your own Werber basically stood up and said, SPACs are dead. No more SPACs. No one should do SPACs anymore. So it's really funny how how things change. Um, although ultimately, Jason, what, what you just said is, you know, the more they change, the more they stay the same, right? We're still in an industry where you have high capital requirements. We're still talking about, you know, clinical proof of concept as the major driver of company value. Um, so we have about seven minutes left, which I think leaves a decent enough time for, for both of you here. And it would be good to get some closing comments on, you know, where you see us going in the next five years. And I'll, I'll couch this with the fact that over the last, I would say, 10 years, we have probably seen more therapeutic modalities emerge than we had in the previous 30, right? We've moved from, you know, small molecules and monofluidal antibodies to, you know, just about every different combination of, of therapeutics that we can think of, including video games, right? So where do you see us going in the next five years or so? Do you think we're actually going to see more of these, you know, mature, and are we going to be able to harness these from a biological standpoint? Um, you know, Emily, why don't we start with you here because you've got the uh, the entrepreneur's viewpoint, and you're you're actively looking at you know how to build something new. Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I think um, I touched on some of this before, but I think you're going to see, you know. I don't know if we've said this explicitly, but sometimes kind of market corrections can be healthy where where then you know, the next generation of companies um, you know, make sure that they're right size, make sure that they have a differentiated mission and 
And if that happens, you know, and we have been a high quality companies pulling together funds from high quality investors, I think that's healthy and, and hopefully, um, you know, that right sizing also can kind of um, improve kind of the talent crunch and, and make sure that, you know, companies with great ideas can hire great people in advance. So I think that's, that's very promising and kind of exciting for the next generation of companies that come around in the next five years. Um, I think, you know, like I said, there's some kind of breakthroughs that can advance where we could go with different modalities, be it new biology or new delivery systems. And so, you know, that can kind of come at any time. And, and that's something to watch that I think um, will be exciting. And um, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, entrepreneurs and CEOs kind of be focused on what's going to be different. Like, what, what is that going to look like in five years? There aren't necessarily quick, this isn't like a quick industry, a quick path to exit or, or to making lots of money in an IPO. IPOs aren't exits, it's a long game. So I think people thinking about building companies now should be thinking about kind of what are really those unmet needs? Um, what can I do with the technology in hand today? And then when do, where do we really need to invest in some of these enabling technologies that will allow us to, to broaden what we're doing? Um, and if we start to see that um, and some of those new new areas be unlocked over the next five years. I think that's really promising for the sector. Jason? Yeah, I, I think what's gonna be interesting for me to watch over the next five years is what happens to that really robust base of early stage companies that we now have in New York. Um, yeah. So I mentioned at the outset, I spent a large part of my career in San Diego and I saw an interesting phenomenon which was that there were a ton of early stage companies that never really were able to make it to be sort of big thriving public companies because they got picked off by pharma at phase two or prior to phase three. Yeah. Uh, they just they just weren't they just, it, you know it just got too compelling. The deals just got too compelling for yeah. for the team and for the investors um, not to take the deal. And you know frankly. Um, some of those companies finally broke through. I mean, San Diego, Merit, Grand Illumina, Trevier, companies like that have finally, you know, sort of grown big. And, and that's my hope. That's what, you know, what will happen with these early stage companies is that you have a large chunk of them that end up being, you know, sort of really big late stage companies. Um, and that's really what is super interesting to me when you have a broad range of companies, everything from early stage to late stage to everything in between. So that would be my hope. Um, as to what we're going to see over the next five years in this ecosystem. Well, uh, mark your calendars. We'll bring you back in five years to see, <laughs> see how your crystal balls worked. Um, Jason and Emily, thank you so much um, for your, your time and the conversation today. Um, this was fantastic, and I know our audience um, gleaned a lot of good information. I know I did. Um, we appreciate Cooley for being our partner, and we look forward to seeing everyone both next Tuesday for our virtual breakfast series and next week on um, April 6th for our uh, Patient Engagement Summit. You can register on our website. It's free, it's virtual, and we look forward to seeing you there. So thanks everyone, and I hope you have a great Tuesday. Thanks guys. Thanks for having me. Bye. with you. Thank you for tuning in to New York Bio's virtual breakfast series. Join us every Tuesday at 9 a.m. for more discussions with leaders from across the healthcare spectrum. For more information on New York Bio, please visit us at www.newyorkbio.org.